successful independent nation. For example, in this famous textbook, His History of the United States, a history and government text long used in our public schools, Webster taught students. The brief exposition of the Constitution of the United States will unfold to young persons the principles of Republican government. And our citizens should early understand that the genuine source of correct Republican principles is the Bible, particularly the New Testament or the Christian religion. Webster concluded by reminding students how important it was to America that our citizens should observe the precepts of the Bible. The moral principles and precepts contained in the scriptures ought to form the basis of all our civil constitutions and laws. All of the miseries and evils which men suffer from, vice, crime, ambition, injustice, oppression, slavery, and war, proceed from them despising or neglecting the precepts contained in the Bible. George Washington was another strong supporter of sound education, a fact made clear throughout his presidency, from his signing of the Northwest Ordinance in his first year, through his message to Congress calling for the establishment of national universities and academies in his last year. However, Washington's educational philosophy had been revealed long before his presidency. In 1779, Delaware Indian chiefs brought some of their youth to George Washington, asking that they be trained in America's schools. Washington received those youth, assuring the chiefs that Congress will look upon them as their own children. That is, that we would look after and train Indian youth with the same care and diligence that we did our own youth. Washington then commended the chiefs for their decision to bring their children to American schools, telling them, You do well to wish to learn our arts and our ways of life, and above all, the religion of Jesus Christ. These will make you a greater and happier people than you are. Congress will do everything they can to assist you in this wise intention. According to George Washington, what youth would learn in American schools above all was the religion of Jesus Christ. Samuel Adams, known as the father of the American Revolution, also made significant contributions to American education. In this work, he set forth his educational policy. Let ministers and philosophers, statesmen and patriots, unite their endeavors to renovate the age by impressing the minds of men with the importance of educating their little boys and girls of inculcating in the minds of youth the love of their country, of instructing them in the art of self-government, and, in short, of leading them in the study and practice of the exalted virtues of the Christian system. However, not only did Adams recommend that students be instructed in Christian principles, he even helped teach those principles by reprinting for the school classroom one of the most famous of all American school books, the New England Primer. The New England Primer, the first textbook ever published in America, was originally printed in Boston in 1690 and was reprinted frequently over the next two centuries, including the edition by Samuel Adams. By the way, most textbooks then were small because since schools were often far away, the small size of the books made them easier for students to carry or to place into their saddlebags if they rode to school. Well into the 20th century, the New England Primer remained a common text from which American students learned to read. Over its two centuries of use, the cover page of the Primer could change from edition to edition, but the Primer itself maintained three core elements, the rhyming alphabet, the alphabet of lessons for youth, and the shorter catechism. Notice the content of the first core element, the rhyming alphabet, and recall that for two centuries, this alphabet was a key part of public education in America. A. In Adam's fall, we send all. B, heaven to find, the Bible mind. C, Christ crucified for sinners died, and so on. The second key element of the primers was the alphabet of lessons for youth. This section was the ABCs in a bold column running vertically down the page with each letter of the alphabet accompanied by a Bible verse. A, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother, from Proverbs 10.1. B, Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith, from Proverbs 15:16. C. Come unto Christ, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and he will give you rest, from Matthew 11:28, and so forth. The third section common to the Primers was the Shorter Catechism. Before looking at this section, realize that the Primer was the equivalent of a first-grade textbook. 
Even though there were no grade levels in early American education at that time, the primer was the beginning reader. It was where students began, so today we would call it a first grade textbook. Notice these first grade questions. Which is the fifth commandment? What is required in the fifth commandment? What is forbidden in the fifth commandment? What is the reason annexed to the fifth commandment? We were teaching the Ten Commandments in America's public schools? Yes, for centuries. Not only was the New England Primer reprinted by Samuel Adams for students in Massachusetts, but it was also reprinted by Benjamin Franklin for students in Pennsylvania. This might surprise many today to learn that Benjamin Franklin was involved with such a religious school book, for he's considered to be one of the least religious of our founding fathers. It is true that Franklin was one of the least religious founders, but ironically, he definitely was more religious than many so-called religious individuals today. In fact, it is not even surprising that Franklin would reprint such an overtly religious school text, for he had long demonstrated his support for teaching Christian principles in public education. Recall the fact already discussed that Franklin helped found schools for African American students where both academics and the principles of Christianity were taught. However, two decades before that, in 1740, Franklin had helped found the University of Pennsylvania for the explicitly declared purpose of instructing youth in the knowledge of the Christian religion. In 1749, Franklin even authored the famous piece entitled Proposals Relating to the Education of Youth in Pennsylvania. In that work, Franklin discussed the scope and content of the academic curriculum of the new university, and he noted that in the school's history classes, History will afford frequent opportunities of showing the necessity of a public religion, from its usefulness to the public, and the advantage of a religious character among private persons, and the excellency of the Christian religion above all others, ancient or modern. If there is any famous American considered less religious than Benjamin Franklin, it is Thomas Paine. Yet it is revealing to see what even Thomas Paine believes should be taught in public education. In fact, in a lecture in Paris, Paine attacked the French public school system because of the secular, anti-religious manner in which it taught science. It has been the error of the schools to teach sciences and subjects of natural philosophy as accomplishments only, whereas they should be taught with reference to the being who is the author of them. For all the principles of science are of divine origin. When we examine an extraordinary piece of machinery, an astonishing pile of architecture, a well-executed statue, or a highly finished painting, our ideas are naturally led to think of the extensive genius and talents of the artist. When we study the elements of geometry, we think of Euclid. When we speak of gravitation, we think of Newton. How then is it that when we study the works of God in the creation, we stop short and do not think of God? It is from the error of the schools, and the evil that has resulted has been that of generating in the pupils a species of atheism. Instead of looking through the works of the creation to the Creator Himself, they stop short and employ the knowledge they acquire to create doubts of His existence. Not even Thomas Paine, the least religious of the American founders, not even he believed that public education should be so secular as to exclude religious and moral teachings. America's first educational laws, its first federal laws, and the declarations of many early American statesmen confirmed that the unique American approach to a successful education included religious and moral lessons as part of academic instruction. Subsequent textbooks confirmed that this philosophy of education remained intact and unaltered for centuries. These are the famous McGuffey Readers, written in the 1830s and 40s by William Holmes McGuffey, a noted university president and professor. His readers became one of the most popular textbooks in the history of American education, selling over 122 million copies in just their first 75 years of use. And these readers are still available to schools today. So profound was McGuffey's influence on American public education that he has been titled the schoolmaster of the nation. These readers introduced students to some of the best literature in the English language. And in the preface to the third reader, McGuffey explained how he had chosen his sources. In making my selections, I have drawn from the purest fountains of English literature and have aimed to combine simplicity with sense, elegance with simplicity, and piety with both. 
For the copious extracts from the sacred scriptures, I make no apology. Indeed, upon a review of the work, I'm not sure but an apology may be due for not having still more liberal